intro, I think, first. I'll okay, do a short you. intro and then it's brief for everyone. Okay, great. I need this. Good luck, guys. Same. Yeah, good luck to everybody. Yeah. All will be well. All will be well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We have the attendees starting to join now um, and we'll just give it a minute or so uh, until we start. So everyone has time to join. So hi, those who've just joined, we're just going to give it another minute for everybody else to get into the session and then we'll start. Equal here. Hayley, do you want us to stay on mute until we speak or it doesn't matter? Um, it's okay. If I, if, I, if I hear a lot of feedback, I'll maybe ask people to mute, but I think it's okay because then we can have more of a conversation. Uh, okay, that's fine. Great. So I think the attendees are starting to level off slightly and it's just been the break, so I expect more people to join as we go forward, but, but we'll get started then. So um, I'm just going to give a quick introduction and then we'll move on to hear from the main event and all the, the panellists we have. So Welcome back everybody. We hope you've had a nice break and we're now about to begin this panel discussion on mental health experiences within HD families. We have our host who's uh, Professor Hugh Rickards from Birmingham in the UK. Um, as you can see, he's waving. And then um, we have um, Archana from uh, India, Matthew from the US and Anne who's now back in Sweden. As you can see them all there. And this panel will take the format of an hour long uh, session and first we'll hear from all the panelists and Hugh, but any questions or experiences you have from the audience are welcome throughout the session. Um, so I'll now hand over to uh, the panelists and if you have any questions throughout, if you can use the Q&A box as well, and we'll we'll get those to, to the panelists as well. So I think um, who wants to start us off then. Would you like to start our, our channel? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good evening. Could you ever imagine how it would be for a person who had plans for her career, who had plans to start a new life, who wanted to explore life multidimensionally, go around places, hang out with friends, etc., would get tested positive for HD? Strange, isn't it? Having born in a family where your mother is diagnosed and died with Huntington's disease teaches how one can be born with neurodegenerative disorders, which is quite unusual for a 10-year-old kid. Especially if you are a girl, your life would turn upside down. Because like every other kid, we deserve that motherly feminine compassion and fills our lives with unconditional love and teaches how one can be a giver and all the time and still be happy and satisfied. Gladly, the spirit in me helped me in accepting the ruthless fact and started to fo uh, focus all my energy in building a life for my family and myself. I am a happy spirited person with a successful career, never had a health issue nor felt a need to see any doctor. Everything was great and smooth and never expected life would throw challenges in most unexpected and uncertain ways. In mid-2017, I tested positive for Hunt Huntington's disease. Looking at the CAG count, everything went blank, just blank. I didn't have the courage to share it with anyone, not even my own family. I was, I, I, was, I became aggressive and I started looking out everywhere to gather as much information as possible. But I had to admit, deep down, I knew it was waste of time, effort and energy. Because, but still, I wanted to try and fight fight the, this uninvited chaos, which has tied me down. Then I stumbled upon this UK-based support group, HDYO, who suggested me that doing physical workout will help me delaying the onset of my symptoms. After eight months of my rigorous effort, I became physically very strong. But that isn't calming my mind, nor it is giving me any happiness. I'm still depressed and lacking emotional strength. Because 
the non magnanimous the non magnanimous void inside my head was looking at me with a greedy smile trying to eat the life out of me relentlessly i continued to reach different people for help that is when an old friend of mine suggested me to do vipassana meditation center i with no knowledge about what it is what meditation is and i have never heard about it but i was desperate to do anything to get rid of this emotional baggage so i immediately registered myself for the next day 10 days course at vipassana meditation as i was desperate to do anything to uh, as nothing has actually worked for me earlier no matter what so i just wanted to give it a try journey into another beautiful part of my life uh, my life at vipassana meditation center this is neither a rehab nor a psychiatric center this is just a meditation center with a simple yet effective scientific meditation technique designed by great great, uh, great gautama bud himself healing for healing people with love and compassion in this center we are supposed to cut all sorts of communication with the outside world and also the peers inside so that you could focus all your energy in healing yourself in sitting just sitting silently and observing everything happening inside your body and mind and is the only thing we need to do while doing this you uh, while doing this you observe few reactions on your body happiness sadness perspiration emotions anxiety depression we need to learn how to maintain equanimity for both cravings and aversions only then we will learn how to maintain a balanced and peaceful life on fifth day's night on fifth day's night when i was off to bed i started showing this hd symptoms all over my body it felt like i was in the last stages of my hd it, i felt this is it i'm going down next morning i i, I wanted to leave i went and met the teacher there the teacher she herself saw the symptoms and she suggested subconsciously you have been consist, consistently thinking about this disease so the the thought in your mind hit your body that is what you have experienced last night don't think anything from your past life this is not your this is just a genetic disease which you inherited from your mother this is not your fault just don't uh, just focus all your energy in observing the reactions on your body and for, don't give strength to any diseases of your body these are the words which she told me and her words really did hit me and uh, it gave me the courage it pushed me and gave me the courage to finish the remaining days of course with a positive mindset i uh, i slowly slowly i started to accept my fate and that made it miraculously i stopped showing this hd symptoms this i was awestruck at that moment this result gave me the strength to accept my life the way it is and also it made me a most positive person than i was before this technique is also helped me helped me in getting answers for almost all the questions i had ever till date initially i felt hd took my life away from me but i would tell you it made me explore the compassionate dimension within myself with a humble tone i'd say i got this rare and cureless disease within my body to carry for the rest of my life i have accepted you my life has changed from literally nothing to beautiful something vipassana made me totally a new person which i wasn't earlier i know what i was 2 years ago and i know what i am right now with i am more positive person with more strength with new way with new hope to with new means to way, way to lead my life and more ha- with more happiness and with new with new in, with new strength vipassana should another thing is like vipassana should be practiced only for patients whoever are in their initial stages or in their uh, or who are not showing any symptoms as the movements might be interfered if it is in the sec- uh, later stages of the time also vipassana should be practiced if, if it is for the very first time it is advisable to practice right in front of a teacher because vipassana will uh, this technique is very intense and uh, uh, it uh, the chances uh, and uh, you will definitely develop anxiety and you might uh, get stuck just like me so in uh, in those kind of situations you will need a help of a teacher so it is always advisable to practice vipassana in front of a teacher for the very first time once you master the technique you can do it on your own whenever you want post vipassana i made it a mission to help as many people as possible who are fighting with anxiety depressions trauma and who are lacking emotional strength 
that is when i came upon this uh, society hdsi uh, huntington's disease society of india which was officially inaugurated by ehdn president swain olaf and uh, astri arnesen and uh, ghi uh, founder uh, dr ralph freeman it was a great platform for every one of us as we got too much too many insights about the disease researches happening across and how things are working there so it was overall a great uh, exposure for every one of us there also i had this privilege to share my story and uh, met few hd families there each and every family suffering in their own way which was quite painful so since then i started to get in i started to be in touch with these families and be them when and be for them whenever they are in need of any kind of emotional support and it's been and until date i am like i am in touch with nearly 10 to 15 families from india on reg, on a uh, regular basis also we have a support group huntington's disease support group which was started 6 months ago and uh, this is for both patients and caretakers but the main, uh, the main, main criteria is for like uh, caretakers at at some point or the other uh patients can be stable but uh caretaker should be motivative innovating optimistic throughout they can't show their uh, they can't vent themselves they can't show their anger they can't show their emotions in front of the patients because it would uh, degrade the patient situations so this is like just a, a platform for them so that they can uh, express their feelings and um, feel little lighter so it is also again an active uh, participation of both patients and caretakers and it is also a successful one till date and uh, another thing which i would like to tell you is it is not not only for people from india i am looking forward to extend my help to everyone here who are fighting emotionally who are having uh, who are down with depression anxiety trauma or who are having any sorts of suicidal tendencies please feel free to reach out to me when whenever you feel low or whenever you feel like talking i'm just one message or call away from you because i always believe we have to work collectively in order to get a better for a better hd society so i am trying to do my best in every possible way and i genuinely need help from every one of you guys so uh so let's stay united and positive until we find a solution for this on a lighter note i would like to conclude by saying we here we humans here are for a brief amount of time some might come with genetic disorder or some might accidentally get them this doesn't change the fact that we are less than any human being normal person us not being able to accept ourselves that is where we are actually lagging so we have to uh, so it is that that is where the fault is so you have to include yourself you have to accept the way your life is and it doesn't matter whether you are a diseased person or a fully healthy person just include yourself in your own compassion and love first only then you can lead a very happy life L love yourself love so love your family love society spread love stay safe and on an earth i would also like to thank matt and his entire team for always for being there for me right from the day i got tested positive and guiding me to lead a disciplined life which made me physically strong and with that physical strength i i i could do vipassana because that is that isn't that easy job so i could do uh, vipassana only because of my physical strength so thank you matt and your team for always being there for me and uh, i i owe you guys a lot thank you thank you <laughs> thank you matt for giving me this wonderful opportunity i can never ever forget I, i'll cherish this throughout my life oh thank you so much that was that was amazing to hear their story she said we have one question from jessie if that's okay and then we can uh, discuss with um matthew and ann about some of their experience as well uh jessie asked the technique you were discussing when you mentioned about practicing with the teacher could you just um repeat the name of the technique for everybody yeah sure it's vip uh, sure it is vipassana shall i type it in the chat oh yeah maybe you can type it in the chat that's a good idea yes good idea mm -hmm. and we have lots of other messages saying thank you um for your story and um thank you for sharing your inspirational story you're very strong ah okay great um I'll just I'll just um retype that so the attendees can see it as well. Um 
no, that's great. Can I ask, so could I ask Arkana a question? Yeah, yeah, please, please, you. The, the, the uh, I'm, I'm, I'll probably say the word wrong, this this Pasana, uh meditation, yeah. what's the, what are you doing mainly? Is it focusing on the body and yeah, the breath? I, I'll tell you. See, it's like uh, we have not on your body. You have to focus on, you have to sit silently and just observe. See, we have on our body for every kind of, what for every action we do, there are some reactions on our body, but we tend to ignore them. So they teach you how to observe them objectively. So it's like you have to sit silently and observe uh, things happening inside your mind and in your and in your body. And while you are, are doing that, uh, first it, it is like it is. Then I'll just give you a brief uh, thing. It's a ten-day course. In the on the first three days, they teach you how to observe your respiration, natural respiration, going inside and outside of your body. That with that our concentration will get improved. That is what their mind criteria is because our human mind is fickle minded. So we keep uh, going here and there. So just to gain the concentration, the first three days they, te uh, they teach you, it's called anapana. Just we have to observe the natural breath going in and outside of your nostrils. So but after that, after three day, third day in, uh, it's like you will uh, gain some, con you'll, uh, you'll get some concentration and uh, you'll be a little uh, strong to do this technique. So on the fourth day, they'll teach you this Panya meditation technique, P-A-N-I-Y-A. This is invented by Lord Ga uh, uh, Gautama Buddha himself. And this Panya meditation technique, it's like for, on, uh, for every action, we have some sort of uh, reaction. So it is like you have to observe those reactions objectively. For me, it objectively, it means, see, uh, when you are, see, it's like uh, if you have to follow, there, there'll be a certain pattern. You have to go it from uh, head to toe or either from toe to head and you have to, uh, if you, it has to, all the body parts should be covered. Uh, objectively, in the sense, I could literally sense another hand going on top of, from my head and toe that way. So what happens when you are going in that way from head to toe? For, if it is for the very first time, you don't get to sense any reactions because it is subtle. So what will happen on this after you practice after second after fifth day or sixth day it will be like you will uh, tend to sense after you practice uh, you, after you put like more effort then you tend to sense some of the other reactions. For me on the fifth night the only reactions which I could sense throughout my body was emotions, right throughout the body. So what happened? Uh, that, that is when I had uh, I didn't knew what it was. It was like uh, so down, such a down moment for me. I thought like, uh, and that night uh, it went. Uh, I went to I went to sleep, but uh, I could I told you know like I couldn't sleep. I had this. I felt like I was in the last stages of HD. I thought like how how, how much of effort I'm trying to put, but still there's no output. So I thought like I will leave. There's no point of me staying there. So that with that mindset I went. I thought like I will quit. Then the, my teacher they suggested me no whatever you are trying to do is uh it's not i just didn't deny it it's wrong your path is correct but the way you are thinking about the disease is not correct just because you thought all these days as negative so the same thing is seen on your body just consider accept it as positive and then see so what happened i uh, it took me it is not that easy to accept the disease it took me a while i took like one day or one well, one day so i made up that uh, i made up my mind uh, with a positive mindset i slowly tried to accept my fate that with that mindset i i did meditate then after that uh, i was awestruck because uh, the uh, symptoms stopped i didn't i had two sleepless nights after that i could sleep happily the seventh day, it was like the best night of my life in that Vipassana meditation center. And I had all sorts of whatever you feel. I had the best feeling ever because until until that date, I, I there was not there was not even a single day where I cried, where I where I didn't cry. Every day I cried. Every day, every day and night I used to cry. Every day and night I used to cry. But post Vipassana, after that seventh day, after that fifth day, whatever my teacher guided, and then I made up my mind with a positive mindset, and I did meditate. That actually gave me the utmost satisfaction. Then I thought like I should share this with everyone because it helped me in some way or the other, and at least that people will also get benefited in some way or the other. Thank you. Thank you. No, You're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder uh, what do you think we move on to um, Matthew or Anne to, to share your story? Yeah. I don't know who wants to go next. Sure. I, oh, Photos. Yeah, you, you raise your hand <laughs> first, so that's fine. Oh, crap. <laughs> See, that's the reason I was asking you who wanted to yeah. talk. <laughs> uh, maybe yeah, go no, ahead. 
Um, go ahead, Anne, and then we'll come to Matthew. Thanks. Matthew. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Anne, but I'm also known as Annie in the HD community. I was born in Sweden, Gothenburg. Uh, my father is Swedish, but my mother is Colombian. So that's why I don't look very stereotypical if you, <laughs> you are wondering. <laughs> but yeah, I grew up in an HD fam family since I was born. Uh, my uncle had HD when I was born from the age of eight. He was the first person in my entire family who passed away. So his funeral was very strange for me because I remember him deteriorating and getting old really fast. And it was very confusing because I, it's it's your uncle, but he looks more like a very sick grandpapa. And I was very confused why. And I saw my family very sad and I saw my dad extremely sad. My Father, sadly enough, got diagnosed when I was just five years old. Uh, that was tough for me because many people don't usually have a lot of memories with their childhood or just parts of it. And sadly, I have a splendid memory as a child. I remember everything since the age of two. So I remember my good years with my father since I was two years old I remember when I started crawling and everything and him picking me up dancing with me singing with me and it was just magical moments that I had with him and he was like not only a dad but a br big brother to me because he was very childish he loved me like hell and he he just reached my level of childishness which was perfect because I never felt like my dad wasn't there it was more like when he got the diagnosis when I was five, I just started school. Uh, he got really depressed. So I, I noticed right away because do you know how children are? We, they are very observant. Like we're, we're very observant. We know when there's a change. And I noticed that immediately with my dad because he suddenly stopped working. He was laying in his couch all the time. He was sad. He was not motivated to do anything. He wasn't even happy when he picked me up from school. And since I started school, I was like, great, something, not, not fun stuff going around the, the house. And then at the same time, when I started school, the first day I started getting bullied. So I thought something was wrong with me as a person because no one was explaining why my dad got sick or like was sad all the time and why I was bullied at school so as a kid I related that as something that was wrong with me which was very sad because I had that thought those thoughts that everything was wrong with me since I was five and then when I was 10 years old my family finally decided to tell me that my dad had Huntington's disease and for me that was like why didn't you tell me right away? Even though I was a tiny kid, I noticed right away. And it was because they wanted to protect me and that I wouldn't be worried because I've always been a very anxious kid. I, I will, and, as, and I'm still now. And the, But hiding it from me hurts me more. So like having these thoughts that everything's my fault, everyone is being mean to me because I'm doing something wrong. That was something hard to deal with when I started getting older. And at 10 years old, I started in the HD community and we were barely any people in it. Like, especially with kids, I was the only kid at the time. And then there were a few older teenagers, but I had no clue what was going on. I got information from a dad's neurologist and just didn't understand. It's like, this man had, had my grandfather, he had my uncle, he had my dad, now he's talking to me. And it's scary because you, you discover it's genetic. So you're like, oh crap, <laughs> that's no fun. So as a teenager, I, and a kid, because at eight years old, I decided to be my dad's caregiver because I was like, hey, he's not doing well. I should take care of him. So I did. and you shouldn't do that <laughs> from my recommendation because your mental health goes down on the floor because you forget taking care of yourself and so I just took care of my dad I sadly he had to battle alcoholism so that with HD does not go together well at all so for me I was his nurse I was his doctor his neurologist psychologist everything you name it 
I took care of everything because he refused to get help. That was the big issue. So I was his caregiver. The state was like, let's let's give this kid the opportunity to work with this, which was really sad. They gave they didn't care. Like, even though they knew my dad was drinking, even though they knew he was sick, they're like they still accepted that environment for me. And that was awful. And my mom was already suffering enough because my mom is an immigrant and from Colombia, if a lot of people know, there's a war going on. My mom had to deal with Pablo Escobar as well. My mom was a lawyer there. So she had to deal with really traumatic issues and then flee. So my mom already has her things. And when my dad got diagnosed and went bad, my mom went bad as well. So I didn't have really my parents for a long while because both of them were doing really bad. And because both of them were doing bad, no one was taking care of me. And I wasn't taking care of me because my parents were bad. And that's how I grew up. I was taking care of them. Uh, sometimes my mom, sometimes she was doing better, but my dad was always getting worse. And that was awful because it started to get to the point where I, I just, I just got depression. I got suicidal thoughts. I tried to commit suicide various times and it was really rough. They sent me to a counselor since I was eight years old. And then after that, they sent me to various psychologists, nothing worked because they, they told me, you're such a complicated case, we don't get it. Your parents are too complicated for us to understand and to give you tools to help you out with, which for me was hurtful because then you feel like, why aren't they helping me? Why, why can't they see the seriousness in my situation? So obviously I felt worse and I, my anxiety got worse, my depression got worse. And ironically enough, when I tried to commit suicide at the age of 15 or 16, I was in the hospital. For the first time ever, my dad was sober and he just crashed in and he's like, you know what? I don't like this. You're not supposed to make my daughter go into the hospital like this and make her feel like this and giving her medication that doesn't work. And for that moment, I, I saw my dad, my dad, not HD, my dad caring. And I actually thought, shit. They actually care about me. I've been blind for so long. So I, I just decided this doesn't work. I have to take care of myself. I have to value myself more. And that's what I slowly started to do. I started focusing on myself. In the HD community, I got a lot of help, not only from Sweden, but from math, HDO. I've been to various European camps through HDO. Uh, I've been talking as well about mental health and with other teenagers and kids about our situation. And that helped me a lot because I always thought I was alone in all of this. And when I realized oh, I'm not alone, I, I started working together with the community and seeing like, I'm not alone. We can do this. If this person can do this, if this person can do this, then I can do it too. And I got motivated and I started seeking more and more help. Suddenly the HD community managed to get my dad some help when I was 20, 21. He was finally sent to a home because he used to live in an apartment right in front of me here. So they, someone finally took care of him. We finally, when I turned 21, I finally had a father and daughter relationship. And that's something I didn't have since I was five. So that was something very important for me. So every time I visited my dad, we did something fun. We started singing Queen. We played We. I was impressed because this man has involuntary movements going wild. But when he's playing We with a remote and bubbling, beating me, I'm like, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm happy. I had, I'm so happy I had to experience that with my dad. And he was doing well. He had to go back and watch hockey, see football again. He also went to the movies, even though he thought he wouldn't be able to. So I was really happy like these last two years or so, he actually had help and get to do these things he actually wanted to do. And for me to be his daughter, because that was something that was missing. And I was really scared that we would end up on bad terms. Uh, and sadly, last year, I went to do uh, studies in Colombia through my university. Uh, so I was staying there between January to June. And in April, they 
God told me the news that my dad had, again, pneumonia. He had gotten it various times. My dad had various moments where he almost passed away, but some, some magic moment just made it say no. Like, it wouldn't happen. But this time they told me, your dad's pneumonia is very bad. He's refusing to eat. He's refusing to drink water. And he's giving up. He's giving up. And he's going to die. And that's when my word crashed down because I, I always had this old man telling me like, oh, your father's going to pass away. And I knew that. But when th the call actually happened, I got really sad, especially since I were in the start of a pandemic. I can't even visit him. I couldn't send someone to say hi to him or visit him so he wouldn't be alone. So it was really crushing for me. And it was interesting because on the day he died I had called him and talked to him and just told him everything that was going on in Colombia and then suddenly 20 minutes after a call I was I receive a call from them and I'm like oh hello what's going on did, did you forget something and they're like your father passed away and as I was like shit really so it proved to me that my dad actually loved me and he was waiting for this last call to hear my voice one more time and just make sure I was all right. And I, I, I was so glad because all of these years I've been fighting with anxiety, depression, everything. Right now I'm only suffering with, only suffering with anxiety. It's rough, but yeah, I'm dealing with it. I finally have a psychologist that's helping me out, giving me tools. Um, Gladly enough, even though I was in Colombia when my dad passed away, and I'm the only child and only family member of my father and only friend, I had to take care of everything from Colombia. <laughs> and that was, that was interesting because it was really complicated, but I managed to do it. And with the help from my family there, my friends there, I actually got through it. I, I was actually impressed how I got through it. I got help from Matt as well, the HD community in Sweden, and I got through it. I thought I would be depressed, like devastated and wouldn't do anything. And, and I'm happy that I managed to do that. And it's rough because I was this year supposed to do my test for HD because I wanted to, I wanted to. And then my father's death happened. And then I got diagnosed with arrhythmia which can be bad, like if I don't take care of myself, but I do. Uh, but it's horrible because instead of, I've, I've always had that mindset of, oh, I'm getting HD, I'm getting HD, I'm probably getting HD. And then out of nowhere, I was super, I, I always thought it was my belly, like because of anxiety, but that the, my heart would be affected. Um, really surprised me and having that diagnosis just made me realize, you know what, I, I don't think I want to take another a, a heavy test knowing if I have it or not, because I think arrhythmia is enough already. And with the pandemic and my father's death, I don't think that's a good idea. And I've, I've been to a counselor like many years. I've been to a neurologist since I was a kid. And I feel like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm taking care of myself. I, I have to learn to value myself. And like I cannot say, we have to find our ways to manage our mental health issues that we got, because I know sadly many of us are dealing with a lot of things. And we have to, the first step is accepting that we have it and wanting to seek help. And when you actually do seek that help, that's what's going to help you. Like that's like, in my case, it took a lot of years, but I tell you it's it's worth it because once you get those tools, you're, you're going to be the happiest person ever. I, I don't think I've been this happy during a pandemic. There's a pandemic going on, but there's some, been so many good things going on in my life. Like I've had illustrations published in, in, in newspapers and everything. And I'm doing well at university and I have a partner, which for me, it's like when it comes to HD, I'm very scared of because I have HD in my family. Please be, be very observant about that. So it's very important for me, like those things and that they are positive as well and that I can see them because before everything was black. So I, I really, for anyone listening that just 
start seeking. Like it may take a long time, like it did for me, but it will go well in the end because the most important part in the in this HD community is that we start taking care of ourselves first before we get involved with something else because our health is actually very important. So it's nice knowing you all and I hope you enjoyed my ti tiny large presentation. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, thank you, and thank you for for sharing um, your whole experience. That was that was very moving. I'm sure all of the audience uh, will agree. And um, I don't know if yeah. Anne has any specific questions for Anne, but we've got lots of messages saying, you know, you're very inspirational. Thank you so much for sharing, and you're you're very brave uh, and courageous. We also have someone that says, you are flipping awesome, telling it like it is. Thank you. <laughs> um so yeah there's yes you can read them after us as well there's so many nice nice messages there um i'm just saying if there's any questions there's one question um that we might come to at the end that's for um Anshana. it's for me yeah um but i was thinking maybe we can um we'll do go, it on, later. go on to matthew and then we can come to to the question um any questions at the end as well is that okay with you, with you? great okay we'll hand over to matthew then thank you very much Anne. thank you well this is one of the uh the downsides to going last is that i have uh, two very tough acts to follow so just wanted to thank arjana and Anne for their wonderful presentations um I don't think mine is going to be half as good, but like I said, this is the benefit of uh, this is the downside to going last. But I guess uh, you know I'll share with you um, a bit of my story and um, what helped me get through it. But essentially, I came into HD. I didn't know about it. I didn't learn about it until uh, later on in life. So what happened was it was kind of the perfect storm for things to develop for this to go unnoticed. Um, my grandfather had late onset HD on my father's side. He didn't start showing symptoms until he was in his 70s. And right around that same time, my father, who was in his 40s, he started showing symptoms. And the thing was, we didn't know what was causing it. Um, we were one of those families where somebody is showing HD symptoms and you truly don't know what was causing it. And unfortunately, you know, we blamed it on my father. We blamed it on my grandfather. We just thought they were being weird. They were being unusual. Um, and then came a lot of the mental health issues that come along with HD, the, the irritability, the anxiousness and everything. And, um, you know, that was very, very tough because we thought that that was their fault. We didn't know that that was due to some disease that was no fault of their own. Um, it really impacted my relationship with my father, with my grandfather as well. Um, my relationship with my father really, really got worse, worse, and worse. Um, his mental health was really not good at all. And I think a lot of that was because you just didn't know what was happening to him. So I think not having that resolution in your mind can sometimes make things a lot worse. Um, our relationship was very, very bad. And we had a lot of fights, uh, sometimes physical, um, because of just how bad it was. Um, it, it got really, really bad at times. So eventually my grandfather got tested and fortunately his neurologist was able to diagnose it as HD. And then my father got tested in secret. And of course he got diagnosed with HD. And my mother made a decision not to tell my sister and I that Huntington's disease even existed. And she didn't tell anybody else in our family really about it. And I don't think it was the right decision, but I do understand where she was coming from. And it was certainly from a place of caring and you know, maybe wanting to protect us to some degree, even however misguided it was. Um, but eventually one of the members in our family told my sister um, because they didn't like this code of silence that we had in our family. So they told my sister and then my sister told me, and I was 13 years old at the time when I learned that uh, HD existed. And it's very tough, you know, it, it was tough for me being a teenager and at the time thinking you're invincible and you're on top of the world and nothing can hurt you. And then you learn about something like Huntington's disease and it really, really throws you for a loop. Um, so I went through a lot of depression and regret of uh, feeling about how I interacted with my father and all the, the bad experiences we had because I didn't realize that was the, the disease. And it's, it's, 
even after learning about the disease, it was, it was very difficult to separate the person from the disease. Did you know that that person was truly being a bad person? Or do you know that that was the disease that was acting upon them? That's a very, very tough distinction to make that, you know, I think I still struggle with to this day. But um, anyway, years later, you know, my father continued to decline and everything. And he died around the time that I was 18. But he didn't die directly because of Huntington's disease. He actually um, died in a very unusual circumstance where he went out for a drive late at night. Um, his car was involved in an accident. The police came. He was nowhere to be found. And there was a search for him. The police were searching all the wilderness and everywhere around for him. Then a hurricane came through. I live in Florida, so that's pretty much a normal uh, occurrence for all of us. But anyway, a couple of weeks later, the police found his body on the side of the road and I had to deal with all of that. So it was very, very difficult dealing with Huntington's disease, every, you know, all of its repercussions and everything. And then on top of that, the circumstances of my father's death, because I just didn't know how or why he died. I don't know what role HD had in his death. And it's very tough because in that kind of a situation, you don't know what the bad guy is. You don't know what to rally behind. You don't know what to fight against because it could have been another person. It could have been another thing. You don't know what, what to really fight against. So I had to deal with all those things and I went to therapy for quite a while and it was very tough. And I guess my way of dealing with it, and it was wrong at the time, but my, my way of dealing with it was to just be in denial and to just say, you know what? I'm at this stage in my life. I don't have to think about anybody but myself. Because honestly, my worst fear was not the disease itself. It was being a burden on the people I cared the most about. And my thinking was, and I think this is why it led to the denial, is if I don't have to worry about anybody else, I'm not going to be a burden on anybody else. So I just kind of did an out of sight, out of mind thing. And I said, if it comes, it comes. And that's how I just continued living my life. But then uh, life is funny because sometimes it forces you to make a decision one way or another. Life is funny like that. But a few years later, I met um, the first serious girlfriend of my life. And I told her about HD and about being at risk for HD. And she didn't take the information very well. And she wanted me to get tested. And for me, I, I didn't know if I wanted to get tested. And I, I had asked her, I had said, you know, if I get tested and I have a positive result, are you, are you going to stay with me? And she said, no. So I said, so then why am I going to get tested? Because I'm the one who has to live with that information and you can just escape scot-free and never have to think about me or worry about me ever again. So, you know, we eventually broke up and that for me, honestly, was the, the hardest part is that rejection. Uh, somebody seeing your faults, seeing one of your, your deepest, darkest secrets and rejecting you for it. And that was, that was really one of the worst moments of my life is, you know, being, being rejected like that. So, you know, I, I went through an even deeper depression and everything. And then years later, <laughs> I met somebody else who um, I started to become very serious with. And I thought again about getting tested. And it's one of those things where I was just kind of in denial about it. But when you start dating somebody and you get serious with them, and you realize it's not about you anymore, you start thinking about whether or not you might want to get tested or you start thinking about the disease naturally and all of its repercussions. So I did a lot of soul searching and I actually did a lot of meditation on it. And um, that really helped me a lot. I mean, I'm still going to say, I think Archana is the expert and I would direct all your questions to her because I'm, I'm just the amateur here. Uh, but it helps me to come to a decision to get tested. And I think uh, there were two primary things that led me to the decision to get tested. Uh, the first thing that led me to the decision to get tested is that I just realized that, you know, what the true definition of love was, is that I said, I want this person to be happy no matter what, even if that means me not being in the picture. Um, you know, we have a famous saying, the famous saying where I'm from, where we say, if you love something, give it away. Meaning that, you know, if you truly love something, you're willing to part with it. You're willing to let that thing have the best life possible. So I said, you know, I want her to be happy um, and I want her to have all the information she needs to make a decision. Um, and my second uh, thing that led me to the decision to get tested is that I had a very faulty way of thinking because 
I don't know if anybody else has experienced this too, but I, I felt as if, again, this kind of goes to the denial aspect. I felt like if I got tested and I got a positive result, that meant I, had, I was diagnosed with HD. I was equating getting tested with a positive result and getting diagnosed with HD as the same thing. Uh, they're really not. Um, but in my mind, that's how it was playing out. And what I kind of came to a realization about with uh, meditation, and everything like that is that, you know, I was just getting insight into a decision that was already made many years ago that I had no control over that was not up to me. Um, and those two things led me to get tested. And, you know, I'll stop for a second and say there is no right or wrong answer to getting tested. I, I understand it's a very personal decision. Everybody's entitled to their own decision. What works for me may not work for other people, but I decided in my circumstance to get tested. And, you know, fortunately for me, it came back as negative, but at the same time, it doesn't mean I'm out of the woods. Um, I can't necessarily bury my head in the sand about HD because my sister is older than me and um, she's at risk for HD. She chooses not to get tested. I have an uncle as well who's at risk and I have several cousins who are at risk. So, um, you know, it's still an issue that hangs over my family and it's still something that I can't necessarily bury my head in the sand and, and just pretend it doesn't exist. So, you know, what really helped me get through the whole process and I think will continue to help me get through the process, you know, if somebody in my family starts showing symptoms is, you know, I, I, I did go the meditation route as well. Um, I did research into a few apps. Uh, there's some good apps out there on iPhones or Androids that you can download that uh, are really good. And the, you know, one of the sayings that I came across when I was listening to some of the meditation and going through some of the teachings is they, they said that there's an African proverb that if you have no enemy within, then the enemy outside can do you no harm. So if you can still your own mind, if you can bring peace within yourself, um, then any enemy outside, any foreign, you know, entity or person or whatever it is, can't truly harm you. And I know that sounds like such a difficult thing to grasp, and I'm still trying to grasp with that. I'm still trying to learn and believe, um, believe that principle every day, but I really do think it is true. Um, you know, meditation is really, really what helped me as well. So it was interesting when I was listening to Archana talking about it in, in obviously much more depth than I would ever know because I'm just the amateur. But uh, what she was saying was really resonating with me because that really helped me in my decision. So, you know, the last thing I'll just mention is that um, if anything, I, I think I'm just a, a lesson for what not to do, if anything, which is I, I was just in denial and I didn't reach out to the community. Um, like I said, there's no right or wrong decision about getting tested. Um, everybody has their right and their ability to make their own decision for what works for them. But what I do think I can safely say is the wrong thing to do is to feel like you're all alone, to not reach out, to not um, talk to other people who are going through the exact same things as you. Um, HD is a rare disease, but it is not that rare. There are other people on planet earth who chances are know exactly what you're going through, can help you um, through whatever situation you're having. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit older than I look. So for all of you young people who are here on this uh, conference here today, you're light years ahead of where I was, uh, I was supposed to have been years ago. So um, if there's any lesson that comes from it out about my own mistakes, it's get involved in the community, talk to people, don't feel like you're going through this alone. Um, reach out and talk to these really amazing people who do incredible things on behalf of the organization on, on almost a daily basis um, and people who just have some incredible stories to share. Um, so that's, that's all I have to say on my end. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice, Matt. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Matt, so much. That's, yeah, really uh, inspiring to hear your story. And we've had, again, some really great comments. There's one here I just wanted to read because I think this is an important uh, distinction to make, as you said. Um, they've said it's especially important to know that uh, testing positive doesn't mean the person has HD. Um, it's just the knowledge they have the, the, the gene which which will go on to cause um, HD or the, the expansion of the gene. Um, so thank you for the courage they've said to tell your story. Um, had some more comments, you know, you're a brilliant young man and thrilled thrilled by your test result but as, as you mentioned you know your family um may may be affected as well and 
other comments saying thanks. Thank you to all three of you for, for sharing your stories. Um, I'm just wondering if we should come to uh, the clarification around the question that was asked in the Q&A and then we can have more of just a general discussion just to finish up the session if that's okay. So I don't know if um, Achana, if you wanted to, to take that one. Yeah, uh, just a second. Uh, can I just clarify oh. you? You had HD symptoms and they stopped. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll answer this question. Okay, hi. Hi, Ashley. Uh, it's like, uh, I would tell you, it's not that I had HD symptoms, but uh, right from the day I tested positive, I was also like into depression because I saw what my mother went through. So I had in my mind, like HD is like, oh, uh, most of the time it's like a dreadful disease with uh, very bad increasing symptoms almost day in and day out. So am I audible? Hello? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Am I audible? Good. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so uh, I, 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 I know what exactly a HD, how, what exactly a HD is and how, how the patient will suffer day in and day out. Because I have seen my mother go through for uh, past 10, for, during my initial stages of 10 years. So that is what I had in my mind. And right after I tested positive, the same, even I had the same mindset within my mind. With that same mindset, I had this, uh, I had this feeling like uh, this is not for me. I, I was actually a little scared to accept the disease and I had nightmares uh, and uh, it was very tough for me to sleep and all. So uh, with all that negative mindset, what happened when uh, you, you with the, when your mindset is negative, it uh, see whatever is there in your mind and whatever you are thinking about that, the same way will uh, it's actually stored in our subconscious mind. So when I actually started meditating, whatever with that, uh, uh, the meditation part was correct. What I did, the emotions, whatever or I saw on my body was correct. But in my subconscious mind, whatever I had about the uh, HD, like uh, very bad symptoms, increasing day in and day out. So all those things was actually that got hit on my, uh, whatever is there on my mind, it was hit on my body. And that is what I experienced that night. So what it, it is like, so what happened uh, that night? It was like, I felt it was like my last stages of my HD because I saw my mother the same way what I went through that night. So I felt like I, that, uh, that that's it, I'm going down. But uh, like my teacher, I told my teacher, she told, that's when she corrected me. All this while you have been thinking negatively about the disease. That is the reason you are seeing what you have experienced last night. Just accept it as a positive and then try and do it. It didn't, it, it wasn't that easy for me to accept that because, uh, see, because accepting a HD uh, patient's life is not that easy because we have to live with this disease throughout our life. Every one of us are here, here must be aware like how uh, the dreadful the symptoms will be. So it took me a while uh, to accept that. And with that positive mindset, again, I, I, I did and tried to meditate after, after which my symptoms did stop. It's only that my mindset was not proper right before I started the meditation, but it was correct only. What, what I did, the path was correct, but my mindset wasn't correct. I had this negative mindset for HD, which made, uh, that is what it reflected on my body body once i accepted it then i could i could the the symptoms were uh, stopped that was actually an awestruck moment for me also actually hope i'm clear i cla i cleared your doubt yes thank you um Martina. i think as you were saying as well when you when you were focusing so yeah. so intently on um obviously what your mum went through and you were just focusing on that and then you started to feel like you were uh, having those symptoms as well so thank you for clarifying that point I just wonder in the last maybe five or so minutes um I just wanted to maybe get Hugh's opinion so I think one thing that's come through in common from from each of our you know very thank you again very brave and courageous participants for sharing their experiences is the need to seek help I mean obviously it takes a long time as Anne mentioned to real to realize that and reach out but when you do feel like you're ready to reach out I know it's different for the different countries in the world but where would you say is the best place to go? I mean, obviously we're HD here as well, but where would you where would you advise people to go maybe to if they need that support? Okay, thank, thanks, Hayley. Um, do you know what? I think that it, it's, it varies so much from place to place where you can get help. I think that the three panelists, Anne and Matthew, and I'll kind of have spoken so well. I don't have anything really additional to, uh, you know, I think they've said everything that needs to be said, uh, but I did have a question for them 
um, which is really something along, I don't know if you can all answer this away, in a way. In the last maybe four or five years, there's been a lot of talk about uh, disease modification in Huntington's disease. And I wonder what effect that's been having on you, because it's a complicated business. So I wondered if you just comment on how you've, obviously the things in the press and things from the scientists. I'm just wondering how you're reacting to that in your own minds, both positive and negative. Yes, Anne. <laughs> No, well, I was, I've been in the, watching everything they have written so far about science with HD and stuff, and like different treatment, not just that. But for me, it's like, I'm, I'm just happy that there are ways I find gene modification, maybe something scary, but it's because it's something new. But I, at the same time, I prefer being a positive person over negative because my father, my uncle, and my grandfather refused to, like, it was always like, oh, we have, we're starting on this medication, and then no, nothing happened, it went bad, and they saw again, they gave them false hope, so the three of them never, like, in the end, they just gave up on hope on, on the future, but as for me, I actually do see a future, whether it's gene modification or through some kind of therapy or other kinds of medications. Uh, I just see that as, as something bright for the future. I don't see that as maybe, oh, this is something that might help me, but at least I'm calm knowing maybe it helps something, someone else or maybe it helps my kids if I get any. Um, so it's in a way it's positive just to have, have it there on board and like have just for the people out in the HD community to see that there's something going on. We're no longer on the first phases of something. We're more, it's now on the process of testing on humans as such. So that that's I what I really find, like you have to find it, learn to find the positive small things in the community, even if it maybe might give a false hope. I think it's better to have false hope or hope than have no hope and just think yeah no I'm just gonna pass away it's what we say with mental health as well like we have to learn how to take care of ourselves we can't just focus on the medication that might come for depression anxiety that works for us but we have to take care of ourselves we have to find other ways to take care of ourselves to make sure we're doing okay whether it's a diet training or anything so i i just think it's it's something that motivates us to maybe be a little bit happier about the future so yeah, yeah. that's my that's my opinion on it <laughs> thank you i don't know whether any of you other two wanted to comment on that yeah even I would like to comment on that. Uh, first thing, it's actually a very good news for, uh, uh, because uh, if it's uh, like uh, how she said, I, I totally agree with Anne. See, if it's positive, it's well and good. Next uh, generations, uh, next generation, it would be helpful for the next generation because if not for us. But another thing is like, again, we shouldn't uh, have that false hope for it because uh, uh, I, I actually read few journals and a few, uh, I, I read few journals of a few patients of uh, recent trials, whatever have been happening. They're like mixed reviews. Few of them are like, uh, it, it's like a positive, few of them are, they are giving the positive of, uh, feedback and few of them have some negative feedback. So uh, it's like uh, what I felt like after re reading both these things, I, at, le at least until the, we have to wait until we get the results. At least for the safe, if it's for a Roche trial, we have to wait until uh, March 2022. And so at, until end of that. So until then we have to ha learn how to be balanced. If it's positive, well and good. For the it will be a good hope for everyone of us and for the next generation kids. If it's negative, we need to learn how to maintain, like, like we need to learn how to maintain how we are leading our lives right now. Matt, I just wondered, you, did you have a comment too or? Yeah, just very quick. I mean, I, I read up on it too. I was I still read up on it um, a lot. I know that there's a lot of very promising uh, therapies that are in the pipeline, uh, but they take time and it's tough because a lot of times you don't learn anything new until a major thing has happened with the drug. It's not like you get daily updates on how everybody is doing in the clinical trial. 
you know, and they probably do that for a good reason because they want to wait until everything's done and crunch the numbers, but you're, you're left just kind of wondering what's going on. But I know that there's a lot of uh, very promising uh, therapies that are in the pipeline. And I, I remember when I was doing, you know, when I was doing my research about therapies that are out there, there was one where, you know, it turned out that it didn't work and it didn't do anything. And I was very depressed, uh, but, you know, I was reading and this was all on HD Buzz, uh, which I'm sure everybody is well aware of the site by now. Um, and the, the author of the article made a very good point because he said, you know, even if a drug doesn't work, it's still a good thing. There's still a silver lining to it because we're learning information about where we need to focus our resources. So although in a perfect world, it would work, it would cure it, it would be over tomorrow. Um, it is still, there's still uh, positives to be taken from the fact um, if a drug doesn't work because it, it actually does add to more knowledge about the disease, about what works and what doesn't and where the resources need to be focused. So, um, you know, I think that's always a good thing. I, I try to keep in mind that I remembered when I read that article, you know, in case you, you find news that something didn't work or it didn't meet its primary endpoint or something like that. There's always a silver lining. Okay, thank you very much, thank you, and thank you for all your thoughts. So I think we're almost out of time, uh, but just wanted to say thank you so much to all the panellists, so much from everybody. Um, and I think it will have helped a lot of people just hearing you share your stories because it'll make them feel like they're not alone. And three very different stories, but three, three stories we do, you know, hear similar things, so people are definitely not alone. And as we mentioned, if you do want to reach out for support, we have the support booth today. And obviously you can contact us at info at hdo.org, email at any time. So what you said, Matthew, as well about Ed and Jeff at HD Buzz is a good segue into the next set of talks. So um, we have a break now, a 30 minute break, and you can join our dance session with Caitlin. Uh, I'm not sure which track that's on. You'll have to check out both tracks to see which one it's on. And then when we come back after the break on track one, we have, um, HD research Q&A with um, the wonderful Ed and Jeff. And on track two, we have caregiving Q&A with Alex Fisher, who I can see as an, as an attendee right now. So we'll look forward to having that session with Alex, who is an occupational uh, therapist. So thank you so much all again. Thank you for the attendees for staying. And thank you, Hugh, Anne and Matthew and um, Anjana. Um, and uh, bye for now. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah.